Hey, this is Joe Gilder from Personas. Today we're going to talk about everybody's favorite subject, preferences. Or sometimes it's called options. Sometimes it's called settings. Either way, it's not the most exciting topic, but there's a lot going on inside of the different uh, preferences and settings panels inside of Studio One, and there's a couple different places to find that setting you're looking for. So let's walk through a lot of the settings that I find really useful inside of Studio One. As with all the videos in this series, I'm not gonna go through every single possible setting you could ever have, but I will show you the most common ones that I use that I think you'll find useful as well. All right, let's navigate to the Preferences page. Inside of Studio One, we click on Studio One and Preferences. There is a keyboard shortcut for that. I use it all the time, it's Command, comma. If you're on a Windows machine, then that's under a different setting. It's under Studio One and it's called Options. I don't know why, but it is. So. Now we're all together on the same page. There are several bigger categories up here and each of those has their own set of tabs underneath. Uh, there's also a separate setup for song setup. So we'll go over that as well. So uh, general, general, check for updates when Studio One starts. That's actually really helpful. Um, the, what's great about Persona is we're always putting out updates to either fix bugs that might be in the software or to add new features. There have been a number of times before I ever came on staff with Personas where there would be something that I would be doing and I would say, man, it'd be great if Studio One did this. And I would email the Personas folks and then in the next update, there would be that feature just right there staring back at me. Super, super cool. You can also change language here in case you're feeling German. I'm not today. Appearance. This is actually really fun and a place where you can mess around with the way... Studio One looks. Um, these are my settings if you want to copy me, but you can actually make it a lot brighter. Uh, this is this is I've heard this is fairly helpful for folks with either have a hard time seeing or just don't want to see a dark screen, want to see a lighter screen. There's those options there. Keyboard shortcuts. I actually set up a keyboard shortcut to get to keyboard shortcuts. I mean, how nerdy is that? But this is this is a really powerful place to hang out inside of Studio One. If you haven't checked it out, other systems I've used did not give you the option to have this many keyboard shortcuts and to modify them to your heart's content. As you can see here, I've modified my shortcuts quite a bit. There are some where I prefer it to be this button over that button and I can do that. Or maybe there are some uh, some things here that don't have keyboard shortcuts and I can create them. There is a huge, huge list here and you can search for what you're looking for pretty easily. So if you want to re reassign the record button, like right here, I've got mine set to this backslash, or is that forward? I think it's back. Um, but we could change that to something else if we want to. And there's lots and lots of options like that. Also, if you're coming from another system, you could just change to one of these other DAW modes and it will mimic the shortcuts from those systems. So if you're used to zooming in and out with T and R, you could do that by switching over to something like Pro Tools. So lots of options here. Um, I recommend spending some time here because it's really, really fun. Network, don't mess with that. Touch input, no clue what that does. All right, let's move on to locations, shall we? No, I don't want to save changes. Locations has to do with where is our data saved. So default, when you make a song or a project or a preset, where is it stored? For me, I've chosen my external hard drive that I use for all my sessions as my place for that. You could choose something like a Dropbox folder so that it stays synced between different systems. However, I've heard stories where Saving your songs to Dropbox can sometimes cause issues, like maybe Dropbox doesn't sync correctly that day and you lose some things. So I actually keep them here as opposed to keeping them on a physical hard drive, as opposed to keeping them on in a Dropbox folder. Plus, I want that on an external drive versus an internal drive in my computer. Auto save documents. This has saved me a number of times when either I forget to save or the power goes out or whatever, or, you know, the, the occasional crash because I did something stupid. This will, I will never have lost anything more than five minutes of work. And Studio One knows when I open it back up, it'll say, hey, there's a more recent version than the one than the last time you saved. Do you want to use that? And I say, absolutely. This setting right here is really handy. Uh, it should, in my opinion, come checked by default. If it's not checked, I would start checking it right away. This says, ask to copy external files when saving a song. So if you download some multitracks and you bring them into a session, if this isn't checked, then the session will be looking in your downloads folder, for example, to play back those files. The files will not live inside the song folder or the, the media folder for that song. 
as you can imagine, that can be tricky when you go and delete your downloads folder because you want to free up space on your hard drive. Then you go to open the song and the files are no longer available. That's why I always have this selected. So when I import drag files into my session, I hit save, it pops up and says, hey, would you like to copy these to the song folder? And I say, yes, absolutely. Copy that all so it all lives in one place. So when I, what I mean by song folder, we can look at that here actually. This is my song folder. So when I create a new song like Broken Temples, I imported the files, dragged a bunch of files that I had downloaded into this session, and then I copied them using this setting. These WAV files got copied into that media folder, which is inside the folder for that entire song. It's much like the way a lot of other systems do it by default. Studio One gives you the option. I always want it to copy over. If you're using a bunch of samples and you keep them in the same place every time and you don't want to duplicate them, I could see why you wouldn't want to have that selected, but for me, that's always selected. File types, I don't ever mess with that. Sound sets, I don't mess with that. Instrument library, that's where you can say where your instrument libraries are. So if you want them on a separate drive for efficiency's sake, blah, blah, blah. Um, this is where you can come reset your, you can scan your plugins at startup. You can turn that on or off. It'll make startup a little bit faster. But I have it set to scan at startup, so if I install a new set of plugins, it'll scan and say, hey, there's new plugins, instead of me having to remember to go scan for that. All right, audio setup, no. Okay, audio setup. This You've seen this before in even some of my videos. This is where we can check what our audio interface is, uh, both playback and recording device. It gives you both options. I prefer to just use the same one for both. I've seen people try to use different ones, and it can be a little wonky, so I just have it set to My Studio Live all the time. This is where we can set our sample block size. So if we're talking about our buffer setting, it's this, and we can see automatically what our input and output latency is at this setting. One thing to keep in mind, it's a little confusing, but there's an audio device tab and a processing tab. The processing tab has to do with kind of back-end protection for dropouts. So if you go really low buffer and you want to get a really low latency, something like this, then it, it will give you a lower latency, but then there's possibility if your computer can't handle it, that it's going to drop out. So if I go to something like 32 samples, and then I go to a really low dropout protection, then we can see with low latency monitoring, my round trip latency is only 6.29 milliseconds, which is pretty cool. Um, over here, it's 2.9 in, 2.69 out. But the, you, you play the buffer game, right? So if you're using an interface like, for example, the one of the quantum interfaces, you can actually keep these settings a little bit higher than you normally would, and you'll still get a low latency because of how fast the drivers for that quantum actually are. Uh, really, really cool. I'll do a video on that down the road. But here's where you find all of that stuff. External devices. If you have something like a fader port or some sort of external MIDI controller or the I.O. station or really anything that's other than an audio interface, it will show up here. And this is where you add them. If you have a new device that doesn't show up when you plug it in, you hit add. You can go scroll through all the different manufacturers and find it there. It's actually really easy and fun to use. Uh, advanced. So this is where I spend a lot of time as well. There's several tabs here that have a lot of those kind of tweaky settings that you may be looking for when you're working on your session. Um, let me go through a couple of these. Locate when clicked in empty space. That's really fun. Um, typically in Studio One, if you want to move your locate marker, like where your playback head begins, you click up here in this little bar. But sometimes if it's a bigger session, you've got a bigger screen, you'd want to click just right here. So when you click in empty space, the marker moves as well. It also will actually, if you have the smart tool enabled, which is this guy right here, when you click in the upper half of a region, the playhead moves. Lower half selects the region, upper half moves the playhead and also allows you to select, okay? So that's that setting. I'm gonna use command comma to get back to this preference page. Um, expand layers after recording takes. That's if that's self-explanatory, I don't use that. Apply folder track to color to content. I like this one a lot. That means if I drag a track into a folder, so for example, let's get out of here. If I drag this Mai Tai track into this drums folder, it's gonna actually change the color of that track to blue. It's a little thing, but it actually is really handy for organizing tracks and not having to spend as much time changing colors. Let's pull it back out and let's change it back to red because doggone it, that's the color of my tie. Okay, back up here, colorized track controls. This is something a lot of folks, they'll see my session and say, hey dude, how'd you get it to look like that? It's this one right here. Uh, when I hit apply, you'll see how, well, it's a couple of things. Auto colorized tracks and layers um, and then colorized track controls. You'll see when I hit apply, the tracks over here become the color 
of the track itself as opposed to just all being gray. There's another setting for getting your mixer to do the same thing. I'll show you that in a second. Show channel numbers. That's just kind of handy if you're curious how many tracks are in your session. Um, otherwise, you can hide those as well. A couple of things. Show event names. So if you have a piece of audio, I like to keep that one turned off for the most part because it gets a little cluttered. Um, if I do it like this and hit apply, you'll see the name of this event shows up in the corner. To me, that just gets a little more cluttered. Some folks may like it there. Do what you want, but that's how you do that. Draw events translucent translucent, I can't say that word, grid shines through. This allows you, when you select this, you'll notice these tracks are a little brighter, but now I can't see the grid underneath. Whereas if I apply that now, they get a little darker, but I can see the grid there. Really helpful for editing and trying to get things in the pocket, all that stuff. Um, draw smooth waveforms. I don't know why you wouldn't want smooth waveforms. Um, I don't mess with the automation settings at all. You can explore those yourself. Use dithering for playback and audio file export. Um, yeah, I do that. It just seems like just I don't want to have to put a dither plug in, so I just just check that and forget about it. Here's one that I, these two I actually use quite a bit. They're really cool. So use real time processing to update mastering files. When you use the project page and you have those linked between project page and your song pages, when you go to update the mastering file, so the mix that's going to the mastering page for mastering, uh, you can do that both offline or real time. Now, as far as which one's better, they're both great. Some plugins work better uh, real-time versus offline. I've done some testing, uh, but you can change that. So it's not going to back you into a corner either way. You can turn that on or off. I kind of go back and forth, honestly. Pre-record audio input. This is really cool. So if you happen to, or you, maybe you're punching in something while recording, and you punch in a little too late. Let me show you here. So we're going along, and I hit record. And as you can see, it's recording, and then I come out. Let's say that I actually hit record too soon, and I really should have hit record back here. Well, with that setting on, it actually was recording. So the previous five seconds of audio was being recorded kind of in the background underneath. So if you punch in a little late, you can always get back to it. On the flip side, you should know that it doesn't work the same way in the other direction. So if you punch out too early, you're kind of out of luck. There's really nothing we can do for you there. Okay? All right, let's go back in. So that is always set. And you can actually change the amount as well. So I've got it set to five seconds. That works well for me. You can change that to whatever your little heart desires. MIDI. Here's MIDI stuff. I don't do a ton with MIDI. I don't do a lot of changing with MIDI. So we'll move on to console. Enable undo. This is a new er feature inside of Studio One where all your console changes are now a part of your undo history. So if you ever had that, that moment where you accidentally click a fader and move it, and you can't remember where it was, you can hit undo and it will undo that. And if perhaps for some reason you don't want that to be a part of your workflow, you can enable that. So that's kind of neat. Colorized channel strip. This is what I was talking about earlier. If we have that disabled, which I think is the way Studio One comes by default, everything is gray and sad. If you don't want everything to be gray and sad, click on this setting, colorized channel strips, apply. Now it's beautiful and happy. Fader mode. Go with touch mode. I don't like jump mode. It means wherever I click on the fader, it jumps to that position. Mm, no bueno, I do not like that setting. Plugin menu, advanced, I don't know what that does either. Audio input follows selection. So that means if I click on a particular track, it'll go ahead and turn on the audio input for that track. Uh, those are things I don't use. Instrument input, kind of the same thing. Solo follow selections, though. So basically a lot of, as I just select individual tracks, it can operate in several different ways. Channel editor follow selection that I do want to have, which means if I've opened this plugin here and I've selected this track, when I select the next track, it will switch to that second plugin in that track, or maybe the first plugin. Um, so it switches based on what track is selected. To me, that's a really cool way of working, but if that messes you up for some reason, you can disable that as well. Audio track monitoring follows record. That means these two buttons here. When I go to record a track, it will automatically hit this button, which is the monitoring for that track. Depending on what your setup is, you may or may not want that selected, and that's where you find it as well. Um, that's all I use there. Services, don't touch services. All right, so that's everything under this page, under preferences or options if you're on a PC. Down here, song setup. This is a separate set of uh, functions, new. Uh, that allows you to do things like mess with the I.O. setup. So this shows you all, here are all the available inputs on your audio interface. So I've got a Studio Live, so I've got a bunch. Um, and here's 
kind of the grid where you can say, okay, channel one is going to be called input one, and it's going to be on channel one. It's, it's pretty self-explanatory. For example, my Persona's ADL 700 preamp is plugged into channel 14 in my mixer, so I renamed that to ADL 700. If I want to record a vocal, like this vocal right here, I can change that input and look right there. It says ADL 700. Also tells me that it's channel 14, so I kind of have double confirmation that that's the right channel. That's part of what happens on that song setup page. And there's a cool way to get back to here. I'll show you that in a second. So this shows me all my inputs. As you can see right now, I'm speaking into input three and you can see there's a little signal there. So an extra way to tell kind of where things are coming. You can import these from different sessions. You can export these. You can make these your default. Um, it's the kind of thing you can really customize as much as you want. Outputs is the same thing. You can have as many outputs as you have channels on your interface. I tend to only have a handful because I don't do lots of multi-output things. So this makes my life a little bit simpler. Meta information, here's where you put the name of the song, the name of the artist. You can put lots of information here and that will be saved with the song. You can even put album artwork here which is kind of fun, and a copyright notice. Lots and lots of cool things there. You can also have this pop up when the song opens if you want. I'm going to disable that because it's been popping up lately and I didn't want it to. All of this is available under your song setup page. Under the general tab, here's where we can mess with the sample rate, frame rate if you've got video in there, uh, bar offset, your time base, a lot of things here that honestly, once I've set them, I leave them alone. Um, but there's some options there as well for you to explore. Now, a couple of these settings are actually available within Studio One without going to the preferences page. What do I mean? I mean this cute little wrench right there, and also there's one right here. So there's one in the arrange window, and there's one in the mixer window. Here's what you can do under here. A lot of times, if you're having a hard time finding something, there's a setting that you want, look here. A lot of folks just don't realize this is here. Some of these settings are doubled over in the preferences page, but here's a way to get to them quickly. So for example, solo follow selection and audio, we've seen those settings before. They're here as kind of a, a quicker way to get to them without having to open up the preferences panel. Um, really all of these settings for the most part are available elsewhere, but there's a handful that are a little bit different. Um, automation follows events. That's kind of nice to have set up. Um, colorized track controls, we showed you that. Uh, we got track, the number showing up here. As you can see, the track number is showing up. Track notes. So this is something that uh, is somewhat new in Studio One. If you want to take notes on your tracks, like this was amazing, you can do that. And they can show up either here in the, in the editor window or the arranger window, or they can show up here in the mixer window in the console either or. So you don't have to have it in one place or the other. This is a place for marking things like we used this particular microphone for this channel and we use this preamp. So if you wanted to know later, um, that's a, available there. I don't use that as much as I used to back in my Pro Tools days, but it's a cool feature I might have to check out more. Ignore plug-in latency, monitoring follows record, monitoring mutes playback, tape style. This has to do with for me, I monitor off of my mixer, so I don't need to listen to the input coming through Studio One. I'm listening to the input from my board itself, so I have it set this way. If I need to monitor in, it's something, you, it's a little confusing to explain, but just hit, click this and kind of see how the recording mode works, and you'll start to kind of understand which way works best for you. Uh, down here in the mixer window, uh, we can keep all of our effects channels to the right and all our bus channels to the right. I have those deselected because I like to take my buses and effects channels and move them where I want them in the session. So if you have a, a bus and you're trying to move it and it won't move, it's because this is selected and all the bus channels are put to the right. I don't like it that way, so we're going to leave that alone. Okay. Um, same with VCAs. I'll keep those to the right that because I don't use them very often. Uh, preserve order of channels with the folder track. I like that selected. Um, we showed you colorized channel strips. Here's a couple of things, audio device controls. So if you have an audio interface that allows you to do some control from within Studio One, such as turning on phantom power, adjusting the preamp on, say, a Studio Live mixer or one of the Quantum, the like the Quantum or the Quantum 4848, some of those different interfaces from Personas have a lot of audio control. This is how you see those. Maybe you don't need them. Input control is one of my favorite newer features in Studio One. It allows me to have a trim knob and also a polarity button at the top of each track. So I don't have to use a plugin like Mix Tool to do that anymore. It's right there waiting for me. Great for gain staging. VCA connections, group assignment, and channel notes. Those are things we've talked about. I don't really have those selected. All right, so I know this is the one of the drier of videos that I've shown you. A couple more things to keep in mind. There are a few settings up here. If you don't know what it does, just hover over it and you can see this is the scratch pad. This allows the cursor to follow the edit position. I don't use that a lot, but if I click here, 
then the cursor goes to the beginning of that file. If I click here, the cursor goes to the beginning. If you're doing a lot of loop-based stuff, that might be helpful. Here is the auto-scroll. When the playhead gets to the end of the page, if that's not on, you'll still see what you see. If you turn it on by pressing F, then the system will scroll as you go. It'll jump to wherever you are. Handy, I use that on and off in lots of different situations. A ripple edit, that's more like a podcast editing kind of thing. And then snap to grid is right here. You can press the letter N to do that. That will go between, see how the cursor is jumping from grid point to grid point. If I turn it off by pressing N, now it is moving smoothly and I can do more concise surgical editing. All right, that's enough settings for one day. Hopefully this gave you an overview of some things to maximize your workflow and your setup inside of Studio One. As always, thanks for watching. Be sure to like, comment, and subscribe for more videos like this. And we'll see you in the next one. Thanks.